Jamel Hill has gone full Hollywood. She knows what it's like to have entertainment vehicles produce her well and surround her with all of the bells and whistles that Hollywood can provide with CGI and other things. So let's craft and finish up and show to her what our people have been working on by way of introduction so that Jamel Hill can be introduced properly anytime she appears with us. It's time for your friendly neighborhood race lady. There it is, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's all we've got. We don't have anything else. It's unbelievably crappy. Uh, Jamel, thank you for being on with us. I don't actually want to talk race with her this time. I want to talk what? Detroit Lions. What? Detroit Lions football is what I want to talk about. You, uh, you love Detroit. You can explain better. You can explain better than almost anybody in sports media what the fact that the Detroit Lions are winning football games means to Detroit. She's a 49ers fan. Um, but she she knows the region. She knows the area. I'm not talking about her fandom. I'm talking about the city of Detroit. She certainly knows that very well. So help me understand what's going on in Detroit and the regional identity that the city gets from what has been historically a laughable loser. Yeah. Now, let me just say that's already the best intro maybe I've ever been given. And I, I you know, when you set the lead up, the build up that you had, Dan, I was expecting that you all were going to have my face superimposed on a Spider-Man costume with like friendly neighborhood race lady, like right there. That's where I thought you were going with that, but I get it because Disney, because trademark, because copyright. I understand you're not trying to get sued. Um, yes, it is true. I am not a Lions fan, nor have I ever been a Lions fan. A lot of people find this weird because I'm a fan of pretty much every Detroit team, but that one, but people have to understand that when I was growing up and I know this is a story that a lot of Lions fans can, can say, um, the Lions were really bad. They were arguably, I mean, they were, they've had a lot of low points, but they were in one of their lower points in the franchise history. I mean, this is during the years of like Eric Hipple and, um, you know, uh, Chuck Long, like they went seven or eight straight years, just as I was coming into my fandom and to my sports fandom where they were well below 500. I mean, rattling off like four, five <laughs> wins and they were pretty much a disgrace. I mean, and, you know, they were like paper bag on your head bad. And so during that time, it was like the 49ers. My mother was a big fan of Joe Montana's and she talked about him a lot. And so I just sort of started gravitating to the 49ers and seeing the misery that my friends and my family have gone through for decades because of this team. Why would I want anything to do with that? And so I just kind of never really rooted for them. I never rooted against them. They were, I was just very indifferent to them. But to answer your question about what this means for the city of Detroit, I can very well speak to that. Uh, I'm living it because my husband is a huge Lions fan. He's been a Lions fan his whole life. He's from Detroit as well. And I'm happy for him to see him this e excited. I mean, just a couple of years ago, when we were living out here in LA, you know, the Lions are not that far removed from being, what was it, uh, three and 13? Um, something along those lines. That was Dan Campbell's first season. Uh, they weren't very good. And a lot of Lions fans were very disappointed because it was more of the same that they had gotten under Matt Patricia. But I've often said this, that even though Detroit has different nicknames in terms of a sports town, they've been called Hockey Town, which I'm sure Roy loves uh, because of the Red Wings um, and their success uh, that they've had in the past. But truthfully, if the Lions went to a Super Bowl, and certainly if they won it, them just even going to a Super Bowl would probably be the biggest sports story in Detroit history and um, maybe even the state's entire history because people there have been waiting for this for a long time. So put them in the same category as Cleveland Brown fans and uh, any of the other franchises that have suffered through bad management, poor leadership, bad coaching, um, players that didn't live up to expectation. They have suffered through all of it, numerous humiliations. So I'm happy for the city. I'm happy for my husband. Um, and for all the Lions fans who've had to endure this, and now they finally have a moment. Explain this part to me, because I don't know what this city is at its core. Hockey has done some winning. Baseball has done some winning. Basketball has done some winning. Is that a football town first? Uh, it is. I mean, it's not any different than I think a lot of towns in America are, particularly talking about the Midwest. Detroit is still very much the Midwest. It's, it's, it's driven a lot, you know, by football. And 
this year in particular, you know, you have U of M who won a national title. Now you have the Lions in position uh, to, to play where they're playing meaningful games and, and certainly have a shot at going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for a lot of people, the identity of football very much relates to the identity of the town. I mean, really every every winning team or every team in Detroit takes on the personality of Detroit. Uh, I don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg or whether or not they have players and teams that just fit the personality or those players and teams begin to fit the dynamic of Detroit, which is blue collar, hardworking, you know, um, you know, very transparent people, very nice people, you know, all of these characteristics of uh, gritty city because Detroit, you know, has often not been regaled very highly in the national media, you know, for so many years, Detroit was like the butt of the national joke when it came to crime, when it came to poverty during the recession, when it went viral about how there were homes in Detroit that were going for a thousand dollars that you could buy. Like people are always, there's a long history of people always laughing at Detroit. And it's something that people from Detroit take very personally. And so when there is a time where we can show people that good things, positive things, great things happen in the city, um, that's when I, I think we really are at our, our, we really are filled with the most pride is, is allowing people into our layer, into our city to see like, despite what people say about this city, good things are here. I want to see if I can make Jamel wince or cringe. I don't know if she has seen this press conference question that was directed at Todd Bowles before this game. Listen to this. I hope you have not seen this. Coach, uh, looking forward towards um, Detroit, um, the weather has been a factor in some of the playoff games, even for the most prepared teams. Uh, today, it's uh, 13 in uh, Detroit, which doesn't compare to some of the temperatures we tend to go up to. Any special plans to acclimate the team to not only uh, endure, but perform in those kind of frigid temperatures should you face them in Detroit? You do know we play indoors, right? They got a dome. I don't know. Um, no, nothing planned. We're, we're indoors. <laughs> it's like one of those uh, want to get away commercials that Southwest <laughs> Airlines used to have. <laughs> okay, so this is what I want people to understand. Um, one, yes, it's absolutely correct. As a journalist, you got to know that, right? That's a must know that Detroit has been playing in a dome for like <laughs> a thousand years, all right? Like they, they, they have, you know? So like, it didn't just start with Fort Field, they had the Silver Dome before that, like kind of ha has happened. But what, uh, one, Ty Bowles, I mean, was relatively gracious in his answer because I know a lot of coaches that would have sought to humiliate that reporter in front of everybody and, you know, with the cameras rolling. I'm just gonna guess that this is not, clearly somebody who covers sports and you know that it gets to a certain point when a team is successful in the playoffs and understand a lot of local news stations are understaffed and they do not have people to just cover sports a lot of the news anchors or a lot of the field reporters who do you primarily do news are sometimes put over into sports because they just don't have enough bodies to cover everything and so I'm going to guess that this is probably a woman that was dropped into this situation who does not cover sports on a regular basis, saw that Tampa Bay is playing at Detroit. And, you know, I mean, she immediately thought they got to play outside. It's Detroit. I mean, Cleveland plays outside. The Bears play outside. She was just like, hey, two plus two equals four. It's Detroit. The weather's cold. It's 19 degrees. <laughs> they should probably be playing outside. So, I, I want to put the picture up of Todd Bowles here just so that we can look at it together because Todd Bowles does seem – he is being gracious, but you can see on his is. face uh, – and Jamel was gracious there as well. You can see on his face that he is finding uh, the, the question uh, a bit perplexing. I want to play some more sound here for Jamel, though, because I saw that Chris Collinsworth – people like to beat up on Chris Collinsworth. And when we got that awful hit on, on Higby in the uh, Detroit Rams game – Collinsworth said that a, a player would rather be hit in the head than in the knees. And a lot of people uh, ripped Chris Collinsworth for saying, yeah, yeah, they'd rather be drooling later in life than have a leg, leg injury. But listen to Edelman and Amendola talk about how they tried to conceal he head injuries because what Collinsworth said was absolutely true. Listen to Amendola and Edelman on this. 
one time you looked at me and you said, oh, if I get hit one more time in the head, I, I see that star again. I'm going to have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I think he saw the star like seven more times that year and played for like seven more years after that, too. <laughs> yeah, so, that star. That's just that's that's a, star. that star. Yeah. What was our pact on punt returns? If one of us would get knocked out, then the other one would come peel us off the ground so we didn't have to miss the game and then possibly the next game because we had incentives on playing. So it was like, when I come over to you after you get dunked on punt return, I'll come pick him up and I'll say, grab your knee, grab your knee. Oh. And so we're trying to beat the system. And he, he'd come in and he'd say, hey, dude, it's 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 November 3rd. It's about 2 o'clock. We're down by 7. They'd bring in the independent doctor. Hey, it's fucking 2 o'clock. <laughs> we're down by 7. It's about 2.30. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Proactive. Proactivity. So it's a combination of honest and disturbing to hear them laughing about <laughs> that that way. Yeah, well, and then it shows you football players are wired differently. I mean, I, I've talked to them enough to know, interviewed them enough on the, over the years. You have too, Dan. They, they got a chip in them that is different than anybody else's where they have normalized this type of punishment. And it's interesting that Chris Collinsworth took that criticism because as soon as that hit happened, I tweeted, this is why players say they'd rather get hit in the head than in the knee. And I've heard so many of them say that publicly. I've heard them say it privately. And that's part of being built much different because if we step back from it and analyze what football is and what it does to the body, as, as many doctors have said, it's being in a car collision every single play or, you know, for four straight quarters or whatever. And you have to be a little... I don't want to use the word crazy, but that's the only word that comes to mind in order to play that sport and to know what you will face. And so um, I'm not surprised that they said that, you know, players have been cheating the system for a while. You have to you do have to honestly save them for themselves so that years down the line, they won't regret some of these decisions that they've made. That was your friendly neighborhood race lady. Not a single question about race. Not a single one. I feel proud of ourselves. Uh, but, but Dan, though, I'm about to derail it, though, because, no. see, no. I am. Because I feel like you, you, you have false advertised to people. Like, I was supposed to come on and talk about race, and I didn't. There is a racial element to the lion story that very much involved me that you didn't ask me about. I'm sorry, we don't have time. We are, we've run out of time. We, we can't, I know. We can't do it. Are, are you it wasn't my fault, America. It was Dan's fault. Are you des asked Wait, the if, if you're desperate to do it, we'll just play this music behind you and you can do it. But I didn't invite it. I was going to get out of here without doing it. If you insist on doing it, I will cede the floor to you. All right, so here it is, Dan. I have a, Lions, a lot of Lions fans who have been in my mentions because during Dan Campbell's introductory press conference when he was introduced as the Lions coach, it was bizarre. And I know you all made fun of it when he talked about the whole biting kneecaps and it just sounded real cannibalistic. And it was a bizarre thing. And my quote tweet was, this is who black coaches are losing opportunities to. Now, since the Lions have started winning, like nobody was tweeting me when they was 3 or 13, of course. But since the Lions have started winning, all of these fans have resurfaced this tweet. They've called me every race baiter in the book uh, based off what I said three years ago when he was introduced. But here's what these people do not understand. One. I'm glad it worked out and that Dan Campbell is turned out to be a fine coach and that he's sending the Lions in a direction that is unprecedented for this franchise. But it was never about Dan Campbell. That it was, was always about the process. That is what lady. I was critiquing, was the process. Because the race lady is on it. See ya. See I'm sending out race tickets. I don't care. <laughs> See you later, Jamel.